Hi, good afternoon and welcome. Thanks so much for being here today. We are gonna give just a couple of minutes to the rest of our attendees to sign in and, um, and we'll just be getting started in just a couple of minutes. All right, well, it looks like we have a full crowd now. So um, let's go ahead and, and get this webinar started. Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, how to use data to promote health equity during COVID-19 pandemic. We hope everyone is staying safe and healthy and we're glad that you could be here with us today. Before we get started, I just wanted to be sure to invite you to write down your questions in the chat box. And at the end of the presentation, we'll be answering your questions. And if time permits, we'll also conduct some live demos using your suggested counties and topic areas. So please stay tuned. All right, so today's speakers are um, here, as you can see, our wonderful Salud America curator, Amanda Merck, myself, Rosalie Aguilar, I am Salud's project coordinator. And we also have a very special guest, Dr. Hali Mata, a Salud hero of ours, who um, she is a public health specialist in the Paso del Norte region and is a part-time professor at U University of Texas, El Paso, School of Nursing, and New Mexico State University Public Health Sciences. Okay, so for those who aren't familiar with uh, Salud America, we're a national organization that creates culturally relevant and research-based stories, videos, and tools to inspire people to and support healthy change in their um, community through policies and systems change. We inspire them to create environments where Latinos can equitably live, work, learn, and play. We're hosted, we're based at UT Health San Antonio, and we're under the direction of Dr. Amelie G. Ramirez. You can find us at www.salud-america.org or on social media at Salud America. All right, so here's a brief overview of our agenda for today. Um, first, we'll briefly talk about um, how COVID-19 impacts Latinos, and then we'll look at Salud America's Health Equity Report Card tool and talk a bit further about its features. We'll explore some of the data and topic areas, and then we'll let you hear from Dr. Hali Mata, who's an actual user of the report card tool. At the end, we'll answer your questions and do our interactive demo. All right. So I wanted to start off by sharing um, just the latest information we have um, based off of a bilingual infographic that we've developed on eight ways COVID-19 impacts Latinos. The graphic highlights how COVID exacerbates disparities in Latino communities. So if you haven't heard by now, new cases of COVID-19 and higher death rates are disproportionately affecting Latinos and Black communities all over the U.S and especially in cities like New York City where COVID-19 has been uh, has hit the hardest. We also know that Latinos comprise a large part of essential workers with many holding jobs on the front lines. Only 16% of Latinos have jobs that allow them to work safely from home. And many times the nature of these jobs combined with certain living conditions like multi-generational households make it difficult to practice social distancing. We know that at least 19% of Latinos in the US lack 
health insurance. However, as you can imagine, and you'll see later on in this report, that number is actually much higher in certain areas. Also, underlying inequities in poverty and, and food insecurity, affordable housing and access to open spaces puts Latinos at risk for being hit hardest. So please be sure to share this bilingual infographic and access it at salud.to slash COVID graphic. Now we'll talk about our health equity report card tool and some of its features. The Salud America Health Equity Report Card is a data tool that shows you how your area compares to the rest of the state and the US in health equity issues. It contains maps and data to help you understand and help you get started with building a case for health equity in your community. You can access the report card tool at salud.to slash equity report. What makes this tool unique is that we're able to draw from several national data sets and provide Latino specific data for your community. The data allows you to immediately connect social determinants to health issues and link to hero stories, research, and policy updates available on our website. Right now, our curators are collecting the latest on Latino health equity and COVID-19, so I do encourage you to visit. And some of the best features of this tool are that you can really dive into the data at the census tract level. And then you can access reports to make comparisons with other counties and states. And then once you have that data, you can easily share the report via email or print a PDF and use this to highlight inequities and express this urgency to your leaders. All right, so now I'm going to hand it over to Amanda as we begin our topical exploration. Hey, uh, Amanda Merck here. So we know that the American way is not an equal one. Uh, although we all love a good underdog story about individual determinism and beating the odds, uh, we have to remember that there are 330 million people in the US. Um, and so when it comes to quality of life and length of life for these hundreds of million, million Americans, our genetic code is not nearly as important as our zip code. And that comes down to the social and environmental and economic conditions within that zip code. Um, and these are known as social determinants of health. These are the conditions where we're born, we live, we work, we age. So in our Salud Health Equity Report Card, we categorized um, indicators for many of these determinants under these following topics. Um, and we're gonna go through most of these today. Um, and Rosalie, I saw that I am logged in as a panelist, sorry, not as an organizer. So I'm unable to change the screen to myself as a presenter. Can I don't know if you can do that. Yes. Okay, thanks. So going to the bit link that Rosalie mentioned, the salud.to slash health equity, it'll take you to our health equity report card page. And scrolling down through, there will be a drop down menu where you can select your state. Uh, so we're going to go for Indiana today. And then another drop down menu will pop up where you can select your county. And we will try um, Marion County. And so this will auto populate your um, interactive report card. I'm going to go ahead just um, to be quick. I'm going to go through the PDF version, which you can download, um, which, and I knew I would do that. Okay. So this is the first page of the Salud Health Equity Report Card. It's um, pretty uh, Latino focused. Um, it shows some disparities among Latinos and non-Latinos for various indicators. Um, as you'll see, one in six kids and one in three adults are Latino in this in uh, Marion County, Indiana. Um, you can see some of the distribution in that map and all the maps in this report card are interactive. If you click on them, that'll take you to the CARES Engagement Network, which is the originator of the data of the source for this report card. 
um, so that you can dig in deeper, deeper. And I'll go through uh, an example of that later. Um, but just scrolling through the report card, you'll see the bottom three boxes down there. Those are going to link back to research reviews on our websites. So scrolling through, we'll have a page on housing uh, with various indicators, cost burden households, substandard housing, and then you'll see the links at the bottom of the page. Those again, they'll take you to um, resources, best practice, best practices, um, salute hero stories for examples of how people are addressing these problems in their community. So I'm going to scroll through this kind of quickly. Here's some school indicators, no high school diploma, fourth graders not reading proficient, transportation, households no motor vehicle, pedestrian motor vehicle crash mortality. Here's food, looking at food deserts, uh, children with food insecurity, population receiving SNAP benefits, looking at the environment, looking at density, tree canopy, socioeconomic status, looking at population and poverty, violent crime, healthcare, looking at access, uh, who has insurance and who has access to mental health, dentists, and then looking at physical and mental health outcomes. Okay, so um, you can take it back now, Rosalie. And Rosalie will start going through um, some of the specific uh, pages in this Salute Health Equity Report Card. All right, so starting off here, um, let's let's take a look at housing and how this relates to health and COVID-19. So um, for most advocates interested in, in this topic, there are four different categories of housing that impact health, um, including location, availability, quality, and affordability. So maps like the one you see here below give us a glimpse of what areas are burdened by unaffordable housing. Here we're using the example of Philadelphia. And as you see, the majority of census tracts are shaded in dark blue, meaning that over 30% of households living in this area, in these areas, are spending at least a third of their entire income just on housing. This is what we would consider a cost burdened household. So um, as you can see and read at the top, the text here mentions that over 38% of Philadelphia County residents face the burden of higher housing costs. Of these cost burden households, at least 50% are rental households. So many are not even homeowners. Now it's key to mention information like this because as you may notice, the percent of cost burden households does not give us a full picture of the disparities. I would encourage you to dive deeper into the data by clicking the map and viewing the data at the census tract level. Um, Amanda will show a demonstration of this later, um, so I won't do it right now, but we'll see that and, and we'll see that for the end. But just know that the dark blue areas you see here only tell part of the story and um, data from our research review which you can access through this report card tool shows that latinos are even more housing cost burden than non-latino whites um, we see a difference of at least 10 percent on a national level we also know that 54 percent of latinos rent homes versus 28 percent of non-latino whites and the data goes on to show here in our report that nearly 21% of residents living in Philadelphia County are spending over half of their income on housing. We also clearly see um, that there's a huge gap with many more Philadelphia County residents severely cost burdened compared to the rest of the state and the rest of the US. The indicator here in red very um, obviously highlights that. Um, so what about Latinos are, um, again, our research indicates that 25% of US Latino families who are renters are spending between 50% and 50, uh, 50 to 70%, excuse me, of their income on housing. So these, you know, these numbers are even higher when you break down the data by race ethnicity. This definitely has an impact on health. And as we know, many Latinos right now um, are, are not high income earners. So with so much being spent just on housing, families have much less to spend on food, on healthcare, childcare, and transportation. 
amid COVID-19, it's especially important to bring attention to these inequities because when people lose their jobs or work hours, as many Latinos are currently facing, they're especially vulnerable to losing their home and possibly increasing the risk of being exposed to COVID-19. A few other housing indicators in the report are substandard housing, weekly hours of work needed to afford a two bedroom apartment and total amount of mortgage lending. We know that the US has a history of discriminatory housing policies and an inequitable distribution of resources. So each of these indicators just gives us further insight into just how some of these policies are contributing to widening gaps and, um, and poor health outcomes. As you see the mortgage lending indicator here off to the right side, um, loans were only given to about 9.41% of Latinos compared to 29.4% of non-Latino whites in Philadelphia County. With ha housing costs so high, this also um, puts a strain on a family's ability to save and purchase assets and, and the ability to really build wealth over time. Now, briefly on this slide, I just wanted to highlight again how you can connect this housing data to the research stories and policy updates available on our website. This will help you gain more historical context and understanding for how housing policies impact health and risks of exposure to COVID-19 for Latinos. So let's jump into some data we have in our schools. I'm using an example here of Clark County, Nevada. We see that at least 14% of people over the age of 85 do not have a high school diploma. And of course, upon diving deeper into the census tracts, you'll find much higher rates, which have a direct impact on health outcomes and opportunities across the lifespan. Then we have early education provided by preschools and Head Start programs. As we know, preschool is important for closing achievement gaps, but yet here in, in Clark County, what we're seeing is that there are very few Head Start centers. And from our research review, we know that only 40% of US Latino kids actually participate in preschool programs compared to 53% of non-Latino white kids, um, setting them back sometimes up to an entire year in math and reading. So um, again, these right now with the economic impact of COVID-19 threatening um, some of the state support for these early ed programs even more, uh, we, we need to be uh, you know, aware and cautious and uh, really promoting, promoting awareness of how many children are not getting or will not possibly getting the crucial foundation they need to avoid um, poverty and other socioeconomic barriers in the future and, and as they grow up. And so, um, so there are groups looking at this right now and looking at this very closely. Um, here we see with high school graduation rates and dropouts, also indicators on fourth graders and not who are not proficient in reading and the percentage of children enrolled in free and reduced price lunch program. This third indicator here is important as we know that many children are depending on schools um, for their next meal, for breakfast and for lunch. And, and so even while children are out of schools and at home, many districts set up drive-through programs to help families pick up on uh, students breakfast and lunch and um, others partnered with groups to provide access to fresh fruits and vegetables for the entire family and and those who are struggling. Let's take a bit of a dive into Cuyahoga County, Ohio. You know, here we have a map that shows you um, some of the socioeconomic status uh, information that we have and an indicator that demonstrates those living below the poverty level. Again, this is a situation where you'd want to dive more into the data to actually see just how um, how high or, or what the median household income is in certain areas where, where it appears that people are earning less. Because as you saw in the first page that Amanda shared of the report card, there's a very clear distinction in many counties between the Latino median household income versus the rest of, of the nation. And then for this um, page of the report card, we also have indicators on no high school diploma, violent crime rates, and children living um, below poverty. 
We don't have a specific indicator that highlights rates of abuse, but I know um, Amanda has curated some information on how the incidence of domestic abuse has gone up in many cities as families are having to stay home. This is also an opportunity for, uh, for folks to speak to their leaders and say, hey, this information does not exist. This data is not being collected. We need to collect that data in order to be able to address these type of issues, um, especially during times of pandemic like this. And here with uh, healthcare, again, um, I mentioned earlier that many Latinos do not have access to health insurance. At a national level, that rate is 19%, but we know that in um, certain parts of the country, that rate is truly much higher. Um, so, you know, and we also know that many Latino workers who need access to that insurance and government benefits are least able to access it. Um, so areas of the country, like here you see Denver County, um, it shows 10% roughly of the population are uninsured, but, but we are seeing right now that all over the country, um, patients, areas that normally see uh, maybe 9% of Latino patients in their hospitals are seeing much higher rates of, of these patients being hospitalized with COVID-19. Um, and so again, important to, to take a look at this, access to primary care rates, uh, primary uh, access to, um, to prenatal care during the first trimester, also very important. And then uh, we also have the following indicators on access to mental health providers, 30-day hospital readmissions, and access to dentists per 100,000 of uh, the population. Now, I'm gonna switch over and let Amanda take over at this point so she can share more. Thanks. So um, looking at food, um, we know that lack of affordable, healthy food is uh, common in areas with large Latino populations. Uh, so looking at food deserts here, uh, it's nice to look at a map like this and then also look where uh, higher concentrations of Latinos live or maybe low income families live. Um, we know that across the lifespan, insufficient intake of micronutrients of healthy food is linked to reduced immune function, loss of pr productivity, um, hyperthyroidism, hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, depression, um, and overall poor health. So ensuring that families have access to healthy food um, is very important. Um, but also we're seeing that right now during COVID-19, as people are trying to stock up on groceries and they're trying to do more shopping online in hopes of kind of hunkering down and hopes of limiting social interactions, uh, that this is really hard for families, especially those who maybe rely on nutrition assistance programs. Those are often only uh, monthly payments. So these families aren't able to stock up for more at one time. Um, and often they're not able to shop online either. So these families are kind of forced to go to the grocery store more frequently, thus exposing themselves to others. Um, but then they still face the problem of lack of grocery stores in their area. Um, so these are things to definitely consider um, when looking through the data. Um, also, where's higher concentration of fast food restaurants, um, grocery stores, and populations receiving SNAP benefits. Um, these are gonna be the families who are in higher need of, of support to stay healthy and keep their families healthy. And then looking at, um, this is Pima County, Arizona, looking at some health and physical outcomes here at the county level, uh, diabetes, heart disease, overweight obesity. Um, and this obesity indicator is using the, is BRFIS data, the behavioral risk factor surveillance system data. I'm noticing comparisons between the county, the state as a whole, and then compared to the US. And then also looking at depression, um, asthma, and cancer. And for some areas, Within the Salute Health Equity Report Card, um, part of the CDC's 500 Cities Project, we're able to include the 500 Cities data here as well. So this is looking at Bear County, Texas. So unlike the 
previous data is at the county level, 500 cities will let you dig in at the census tract level. Um, so here within the report card, again, you'll be able to click on these maps. They'll take you out to the interactive version and you can really begin to explore uh, disparities across the city. So just diabetes, for example, you see the darker purple is over 13%. But when you start to click on, look at some of those census tracts, I mean, it's up, it's over 15%, over 18%. I mean, there's some areas that's over 20%. Um, so really digging into those. Also cancer and asthma. Um, so this last section I'm gonna go over today is transportation. Um, transportation connects us to everything. Thus it's very important determinant of health. Also, it's often the second largest household expense after housing. Unfortunately, Latinos are disproportionately burdened by auto transport or auto dependent transportation networks. Um, they face unsafe streets, sidewalks, and bike lanes. They lack access to frequent and reliable public transit. They're often burdened by longer commute times, um, but they're also burdened by higher rates of fatalities and serious injuries. Um, and then in general, auto-dependent transportation networks are connected to higher rates of physical inactivity, chronic disease, greenhouse gas emissions, land degradation, and economic segregation. Um, they're dirty, they're dangerous, they're expensive. So thinking about transportation as the second uh, largest household income, to operate, insure, and maintain a private vehicle, it's estimated to cost between $5,000 and $8,000 per year. So over the course of five years, that's $25,000 to $40,000. And we know that vehicles aren't assets. They, they don't help families build wealth. They depreciate. So without safe options, without safe routes to walk and bike, have reliable transit, um, many people are risking their safety on unsafe roads. They're spending a disproportionate share of their income on a vehicle or they're foregoing essential services. They're not going to the grocery store to get the healthy food. They're not going to the doctor, um, which has a lot of long-term health implications as well. And th I mean, this that cost for a vehicle could be the difference between health and hardship for a lot of families. So looking at, this is Broward County, Florida here. I, I know this map is underwhelming. Um, transportation data in general is really underwhelming. Uh, nationwide surveys, they really only ask about commuting to work. Um, they ignore about other trips people are making to other essential destinations like grocery store, child care. Um, so here in Broward County, we know that some families average about 28 minutes commute time, but some families are commuting over 60 minutes. Uh, we know that about 7% of households don't have a motor vehicle, um, but not sure what the distribution is. Um, and we'll kind of, we'll dig into that um, in a in a minute. So looking at some other transportation data across Broward County, looking at commute times, it varies from less than 1% in some census tracts to over 21% commuting more than 60 minutes. Um, I mean, can you imagine the health and economic productivity of a census tract where 20% of residents are commuting over 60 minutes each way? Um, so the slow decorative report card also shows pedestrian crash mortality, vehicle crash mortality. And then if you recall, going back to the very um, first page when I showed an example of the report card, it has that table um, which shows differences between Latinos and non-Latino whites. And here in Broward County, Florida, there's um, a difference in motor vehicle crash death rate. So unfortunately, Latinos are disproportionately burdened. Um, and then focusing just for a minute, so this is three different counties here. I just wanted to kind of compare them for a second. This is pedestrian motor vehicle crash mortality rates. Uh, we're looking at Bear County, Texas, that's where San Antonio is, pretty urban area. Uh, also Davidson County, pretty urban area in Tennessee, that's where Nashville is. Um, really the other urban area in Nashville is Memphis and Shelby County, and the pedestrian mortality rate there is 4.1. Um, deaths per 100,000 population. So this kind of suggests like, why are more pedestrians dying in cities? Cities are supposed to be for people. Um, but then I wanted to show Milwaukee also as 
technically looking at this indicator, you could say, oh, well, Milwaukee County is doing better than the United States as a whole, so everything's okay, right? But it's important to remember that these dials with, with comparisons between county, state, and nation can be helpful, but the U.S. isn't always the best yardstick to measure success, especially for people walking. Um, so consider Helsinki, Finland, it's about, it's like the same size as Milwaukee has about the same population, a few, a few 10,000 more people or 60,000 more people. Last year in Helsinki, there were zero pedestrian and cyclist deaths, zero. There were 22 in Milwaukee. It's appalling to accept death as a cost of mobility. Uh, we don't accept death in air, rail, or sea travel, um, and we really shouldn't accept traffic deaths either. Um, and we shouldn't accept disparities in traffic deaths, but unfortunately we know that older people, minorities, and people walking in low-income neighborhoods are disproportionately at harm. However, there really, there's not a lot of great data on disparities in pedestrian fatality rates. So this is another area where um, Rosalie had mentioned earlier with um, you know, domestic violence or child abuse. This is kind of one of those other areas where there's not the best data out there. Um, we would absolutely have included it in this report card if it was out there. So sometimes it kind of falls on us too to push our, our county leaders, push public health um, at the state county level to collect better data on some of this stuff. Um, so kind of just circling back. So right now, with a lot of people facing lockdowns, um, gyms, fitness studios, numerous places for recreation and entertainment are closed. So we're seeing people are active outdoors. They're using parks, greenways, and sidewalks in record numbers. Um, it's ironic, it's awesome and ironic that more people are doing what public health professionals have been recommending for decades, which is to get out and get moving. However, many of the options to do just that are too crowded, or as you can see here, it's unsafe. Um, according to the Rails to Trails Conservancy, trail usage is up 200% nationwide. Um, and although vehicle travel is down during you know, COVID-related lockdowns, speeding and reckless driving are up. Um, and often, even though crashes are down right now also, um, severe crashes are up and pedestrian fatalities are up. In San Antonio, for example, pedestrian fatalities are up 150% compared to the same time last year. Um, so cities across the world are responding by temporarily reallocating street space for people walking and biking. Um, they're, they're prioritizing people right now over cars because people aren't driving as much. Um, and this is something we need to think about post pandemic. And so it's kind of under this idea that I'm gonna go through a demonstration of um, the SLUD equity report card, how you can click through uh, to the interactive map. So in your equity report card, if you hover over any of the maps, it'll say view large map. Um, and so I'm gonna do that. Okay, and it'll take you to the CARES engagement um, site right here. So we've kind of already decided this is not the most um, exciting data um, at the census track level for average work commute time. What would be really interesting if we want to consider reallocating street space for people walking biking right now is we would want to see where do are more households that have zero vehicles. So we'll go ahead and um, turn this data set off and we're going to go over here to that blue button add data. And we're going to search for households with no vehicle. And we want to use the American Community Survey, so the ACS survey, and we want to go with um, the latest years that they have. So 2018 is the most recent. So we're going to check that box and we're going to add this data to the map. We're doing this in real time too, so uh, fingers crossed. All right. Let's maybe try that again. Okay, add data. No vehicle. How 
consoles, no vehicle ACS. Add it to the map. Okay. All right, we're going back to square one. Y'all walk, walk through this with me here. Salute.to slash equity reports. We're scrolling down. We're going to find Florida. We're going to find Broward County. It's going to download real fast for us. So we got our Broward County report card. Let's go down to transportation, hover view large map. Okay. Add data, no vehicle, ACS 2018, add to map. Okay, so now we can, we'll turn off the average commute. Here we go. All right, so households with no vehicle, we're going to change the geographic region. Right now it comes up as county. We're going to change it to track. And you'll see um, quartiles are broke down. So the dark orangish red area is going to be over 8%. Um, so kind of zooming in, we know there's going to be some disparities among there. Um, among households with no vehicles. So just real quick, we'll try the census tract here. We've got 16.6% .6 of households in this census tract have no vehicle. That's 174 homes right there where those people do not have a vehicle. Um, we'll try one more. This tract has 19% of households in the census tract have no vehicle. So that's, that's 467 houses right there. So that's almost 600 houses in those two neighboring census tracts where families do not have a vehicle. So if you're considering efforts to some share the streets initiatives, you'd maybe wanna use this data to kind of focus in on places where people don't have a car and they maybe need safe access um, to walk and bike. Um, another area we could add, so if 90 or 20% of those households don't have a vehicle, well, maybe it's because they're already walking and biking. So we can look at commutes by walking, biking. Again, we want to go with ACS, the American Community Survey, the most recent years. We'll add this to the map. I'm gonna go ahead and close out households with no vehicle. And then this again, the geographic regions county, we wanna go ahead and put it to census track. And then looking in those same two census tracks I clicked on a second ago, where 16% and 19% don't have a vehicle. Here we have, that's 0%, I'll just go ahead and spoiler, 0% and 0% um that are walking to work so this area right here very specifically has a large proportion of households with no vehicle and very few people yeah we're looking at zero percent workers are walking to work so that could suggest um unsafe streets um, and so there's a, a couple other data indicators that you could possibly add here to dig into this a little bit deeper. Um, but I just wanted to do a quick example of how you can go from our Salute Equity Report card to um, this interactive map to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and providing safe options to walk, bike, and take transit can impact multiple public health, climate, sustainability, and social justice issues um, all at the same time. So. Going back to this, so what can we do? So now we know the data um, is, like Rosalie had mentioned too, is it'll link back to, within the Salute Equity Report Card, it'll link back to various resources and stories within our website to help kind of build the case to solve some of these transportation problems um, within your community. And there's other data out there to supplement a lot of the data within our Equity Report Card. So 
transportation specifically, there's also walk score, bike score, transit score. Um, the Center for Neighborhood Technology has the housing and transportation index. You can also look at your county for hotspots. Where are these crashes happening? Where are the severe traffic crashes and severe pedestrian crashes happening? Um, and then combining all that with these other resources from our website to make the case. So now I'm gonna um, turn it over to Dr. Mata um, and she'll kind of go through how she shared this report. Um, there's various ways, send it to community leaders. You can use it in presentations. You can share it on social media. You can share it through an email. You can show up at a neighborhood association meeting, um, walk people through it. Um, and so Dr. Mata, again, is a public health specialist in the Paso del Norte region. She's a part-time professor at UTEP, the School of Nursing, um, and she teaches in public health sciences. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Dr. Mata. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, Rosalie. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Holly Mata, and um, I'm really excited to be part of this webinar today. And um, I just want to give you all a shout out who are uh, participating in this webinar. We're so grateful for all the work you do every day to support health and health equity in your communities. And um, when I was asked um, if and how I'd been using this report card as someone who's um, been familiar with and has um, really found the solid resources useful over the years, um, when they asked about the report card, I had actually just discovered it. Uh, I'm usually checking um for things that this team develops because they are really useful at the community level and uh at the time um we um, were working as a community health council in southern new mexico um, otero county new mexico was working on a community health assessment and we were able to use this report card um, both to highlight some of the disparities and inequities that we knew existed um, and that we had data for, but um, that we didn't have, uh, we didn't have the data in a user-friendly and community-friendly format yet. And so the report card um, number one helped us really understand uh, some easy and um, user-friendly ways to communicate some of these data, um, and also provided us a way to share the data um, in the report that the, that the Health Council was working on is very long and very detailed. Uh, and it's not really in the snapshot form. And this really helped us realize uh, we need to make our um, report uh, more approachable. And, um, and we need to also make sure that we are communicating to policymakers. Um, it's not enough to just talk about and share the disparities. We really need to talk about the inequities that um, have gotten us to that point and then look at um, solutions and strategies that can help communities um, make those kinds of policy improvements that are going to support health and health equity in their communities. And so just as an example, um, in Doniana County, which is uh, our neighbor to the west from Otero County, I was looking up, I wanted to look at a couple of reports this morning, um, and Amanda shared some of the, um, them from different counties across the country. Uh, but in Doniana County, 47% of Latino children live in poverty compared to 15% of non-Latino white children. So everyone says they want to reduce child poverty um, everyone says we all want our children and our families and our communities to thrive well if we want to make that happen um, it's not enough to just focus broadly on reducing poverty we really need to be tailoring our efforts um, to address poverty in the groups that are already bearing the biggest burden and so this report card really helps you make the case to um, your fellow community members your policymakers. Uh, and helps highlight um, some of these um, inequities in access and in our social determinants of health, like income, education, transportation, housing, the things that Amanda's talked about and showed you in the report card already. We know that these social determinants of health have the greatest potential to improve our community health. And, um, and we found that this report card really helped us um, communicate that in ways um, that we may not have thought about before, um, or um, and also in sharing a, a colorful and easily um, accessible PDF that is full of helpful links that people can explore and take a deeper dive into the data. You saw Amanda's um, literally 30 to 60 second um, map making uh, 
processes that enable anyone. You don't have to have GIS experience. You don't have to um, you don't have to do much other than click several times. Um, the CARES Engagement Network that um, where that data is coming from has a lot of helpful tutorials. Um, you can go much deeper than what's in the report card. But what we loved about the report card was that it's easy to to access all of those resources for one place. You can take a look at uh, success stories and initiatives from other communities where um, they've really made a difference by um, honing in on and focusing on those areas um, where those inequities exist and saying, what can we do um, to make things better in our community um, and what, what's happened in other communities and taking some of those evidence-based interventions and tailoring them um, for what you need in your community is what makes this so useful. And we've also been able to use the, if you notice the report card has a lot of graphics um, that are great to, um, to take out of the report and put into uh, either presentations that you're doing um, or reports um, that you're writing. You don't have to use the whole report card. You can take um, bits and pieces of it. And uh, it just seems like this um, tool is coming at a really important time because as we've all been talking about, um, we know that in this time of the pandemic, uh, this crisis is just worsening our existing inequities and our people and families who are already vulnerable are bearing the burden of higher rates of illness, less access to testing and healthcare, delayed economic recovery support. And, uh, and I just really feel like these kinds of reports help us understand that now more than ever, we really have a responsibility and the opportunity to invest in community and policy improvements that support health and health equity for all our residents. So um, that's been my experience with a report card, um, just that it's uh, very helpful, very useful, and um, helps us communicate our data in ways that um, hopefully will support and, um, and promote the kinds of changes we need to uh, improve health for everyone. Thank you so much, Holly. Um, so we did, uh, we wanna open it up for um, questions, if you'll have any, and then Rosalie, again, sorry, because I'm in panelist mode, I cannot see any of the chats. So if anyone has questions, um, please feel free to submit these in the chat box or the question box. I see a few here. Um, all right. So of course, this presentation is being recorded and um, we do encourage you to share that with your colleagues. Um, we have a question. Does the percent, does the percentage represent Latino population or general population? Um, so yes, I think the answer to that is, um, you know, depending on which indicators you're looking at, that first page, you'll see a table that has the Latino compared to non-Latino white percentages. But for the rest of the um, indicators below this page, uh, most of these typically represent the entire county, just because that's the data that's available um, at a national level. Um, so, so yeah, we would have to do a further dive into that data, break it down by race, ethnicity um, for each one of those indicators. But this gives you a good snapshot, a good um, place to start. And um, Rosalie, one question. of the things, oh, can I just add that one of yeah. the things that is really useful about the CARES Engagement Network is in addition to the mapping tools that they have, they also have a community health needs assessment. There's a whole section um, at the CARES Engagement Network for CHNA reports that people can choose um, choose from a really long list of indicators. And then um, those reports will also give you a breakdown by race, ethnicity, not just comparing non-Latino whites to Latinos, but, um, but other racial ethnic groups and by age, um, by sex. And so you can get a lot more detailed information from the CARES Engagement Network, which is linked right out of the health equity report card. Correct. That's so true. And, and yeah, we've definitely done that. Those reports are wonderful. Um, the next question is, uh, what do you do 
to get this data to community partners? How do you ensure they know how to use it? And do you know how they're using it? And if so, do you have some examples? Um, so I think we heard some really nice examples from Dr. Mata. Um, as far as getting this out more to community partners, we have our network of over 500,000 people who follow us on social media, who subscribe to our e-news letter um, or visit our website regularly. And so, um, so this is a great opportunity for you to share with your own networks, um, share this information. And, um, and yeah, and so, so that's why we organized this webinar today. Um, Amanda, I don't know if you have anything else to add to that. Yeah, thanks. Um, it, it is hard to know which community organizations are using what data. Um, so it really comes down to um, having a relationship with some of them. Um, if you don't have that relationship yet, um, you can start on social media. Um, you can find maybe their communications person um, and then build those relationships, find out what their goals are, depending on these certain organizations. Is their goal child health in general? Is their goal pedestrian safety? Is it, you know, helping victims of domestic violence? So finding out what of these other social indicators might be relevant to them that they maybe haven't thought about in the past. Um, but also using some of this to bring that kind of historical context as well. A huge part of, I think, everything we aim to do through our health communications with Sud America is to keep the focus on social, environmental, and systems issues, um, and definitely removing any stigma from, from individual behavior change. Um, not absolving people of individual responsibility, but putting responsibility on, you know, city leaders, on state leaders to create healthy, equitable neighborhoods where people where it's easy to make the safe choice where people you know there's no income inequality and everyone has equal access to housing um so yeah just it it's just that conversation is gonna have to start at some point and there's various I mean, there's gonna be various organizations with your community various coalitions and various elected officials that are already ahead of the game they're already talking about this they're already pulling data from multiple sources. I mean, in San Antonio, um, when they launched the Vision Zero program here, that is really when they started to collect important data on pedestrian fatalities, where before that, we just didn't really have it. So sometimes a conversation needs to start to say, this data isn't here. It's not in this report card. It's nowhere, no one has it. We need someone to be collecting this information. Amanda, you brought up a great point about uh, individual responsibility, and um, and I found over the years, um, oftentimes people who are not working in public health or um, may not be as familiar with the the research um, really have that focus of well, we just need to get people to make better choices, or we just need to get people to do things differently. And one of the um, the things that's really nice about um, this report card and these tools are it really helps you make the case that. Um, Yes, that's you know it's true. You can acknowledge that. You can acknowledge that. Yes, it would be nice if um, if people did things that um, contributed more to their health. But we do know that the 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 most effective way to have to support healthy behavior changes are to improve the policies, the systems, and the environment in which people make those choices. And so it's really a it's a way of framing it in you know those are not incompatible um, goals, and in fact they're very compatible. And the more things we do at the environmental level, the more we can improve transportation and the more we can make our sidewalks connected and the more things we can, the more we can make sure everybody has a safe park to play in in their neighborhood, um, the more likely it is that people are gonna get more exercise and that people are. So um, I think this tool really helps frame it as, you know, yeah, we know that, um, that it's better for people to eat healthier and get more exercise and to stop smoking. But we also know that what we do in our environments and our communities can either make it make that more likely to happen um, or can make it really difficult and we all want to make it more likely to happen so let's look at some of these some of the ways in which our community um, can take steps to make um, to support health and healthier behaviors among all of our people yeah so yeah true. so true okay um we also have a question on whether this information is available on the african-american community as well and um 
Yes, if you link to, as uh, Dr. Martha mentioned, the CARES Engagement Network, there's a much more um, robust uh, report that you can download called the Community uh, Health, is it, uh, community, community Health Indicators Report. And, um, and you can link, again, through the report card, link directly to the CARES Engagement Network. Um, you'll find a really nice breakdown as well. Um, we know that there is less social mobility in community, so, um, so I'd be interested to see if we're able to show that information as well. Um, not sure which community exactly we're referring to. Um, or, yeah, but, is that um, social mobility, like economic mobility? So there's some other um, SDS indicators out there that look at income inequality. Um, that's another tough one at the county level, unless there's a group who's leading something to really dig into, because income inequality we know is, is not the only factor, it's it's the wealth gap and how Latinos and African Americans do, do not have the wealth that white families have and the generational problems that comes with. Um, so if, if that's still the question, there isn't anything to economic mobility specifically in this report card. Um, I don't think there's really any national data sets that I'm too familiar with for that. Um, that would probably be more at the local level um, that would require some, some urging, some partnerships. Right. Um, we have a question on the data, downloading the data, what formats, if, if it's available. That for our report card, the PDF is pretty much the the only format you can download in, but through the CARES Engagement Network, I believe you can download also um, perhaps more of that data. I don't know if, if you've uh, looked into that a little bit more, Amanda, perhaps. Yeah, they have um, CARE. So the CARES Engagement Network, which is the, the source for all the data sets that we're using in this report card, um, they have two, most of their tools are kind of lumped into two key categories. One is the, um, yes, yeah, so the community health needs assessment. It's a report and you can select which indicators you would like to include in that report. And then the other one is the mapping, which is what I showed was the interactive mapping tool. That's where you can go and you can find information specific to the census tract level. So the reporting will give you kind of averages and it may break down by race, ethnicity uh, or gender, but you're not going to get at the census level. So there, you know, you kind of want to look at um, data multiple ways, but from our report card, you can have the interactive version or the PDF version. And there's also um, the, at the end of the report card, there is a list of, there's a one page table that shows all of the data sources. So for example, if you wanted to, um, you know, if you were wondering, and that's, I forgot to mention, that's another way we've used it is um, sometimes that table gave us like, oh, okay, well, we were looking at um, at the number of primary care providers in the county, but we were looking at a different data source. So it just helped us helped us access additional sources and, um, and you can download data sets from many of those links if you really wanted to get in the weeds with the data. And then um, from what I remember, Amanda, like on the maps you were showing, um, all of those um, for the maps as well as for the community health needs assessment reports from K CARES Engagement Network, they do link to the original data source um, so that, you know, if people were wanting to um, to get more into that or to access, some of the websites do have downloadable data sets that, um, that you can explore in more detail. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect example. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Mata. That's so true. Um, and then, you know, there's other features we didn't quite dive into, but like if you needed to add boundaries to this map or you want to add roads to kind of get a better idea of where those tracks are located, um, you can also do that as well. Um, we have a comment on um, actually a viewer from Canada and, um, and they're inspired to do something similar for their area um, with, uh, with regard to these data vis visualizations. But um, they've received comments, and and they want to know if um, you know if this if this could contribute to stigmatizing populations and local geographies. Do if we ever gotten any comments like that? I don't believe we've received those comments. Um, but again, we uh, we really our network is very focused on highlighting inequities in Latino populations. Um, so 
you know, again, it's all about how you frame your message, I think, is the important thing. Um, you know, you want to, we want to highlight that there's needs, that there uh, exist gaps in all of this, but uh, in a way that acknowledges that it's not an individual's fault. A lot of this, if we if we go back and explore the historical context of things, a lot of this is, is due to policy or systems in place that create um, some types of systemic barriers that people are, are faced with um, contributing to, to these inequities. And I wanted to add to that real quick too, is um, a lot of this is, this ultimately is place-based. I mean, this is, we're talking about the schools, the housing, the grocery stores, the streets, it's place-based. And it, it just happens that low-income minority populations live in the areas that have been historically disadvantaged. So um, yeah, it is definitely important to be cautious about focusing on the population and not the place. And that's what we hope some of the maps and some of this data can do is why do all these negative indicators in one place, these streets are unsafe, there's more crashes, there's no grocery stores, um, the schools are doing worse, and there's no affordable housing. How come all that's happening in the same geographic regions? Um, so yeah, keeping the focus on, on place. Okay. Um, and then a couple of last questions are um, people asking if how is this different from the a census and American Community Survey? Um, it's not really different. I think the data pulls from some of those ACS data sets, um, some of the census and, and multiple sets. I mean, there's just a, a large number as, as we shared. This last page contains a list of all the data sets that, that each of these indicators and maps come from in originally. So that's that's where um, because a lot of it is from the ACS, um, but various other resources that we pulled as well. And then really is this it's about packaging. We just we wanted to package it this way. We wanted to bring in some indicators that are relevant um, because otherwise some people can be overwhelmed. There's at some, you know, to one end, there's too much data out there. So how do you put something into a report? How do you do it on your own? So we thought. It's about packaging it this way in a way that kind of puts similar indicators together. It's not too burdensome. It's about nine pages. It's something you could easily print out and share with someone else, or you could play with the interactive version. Um, and then we have a question about whether a person can sort county level or census track data uh, at the state level if they can do kind of a sort and, and look at she gives the example of zip codes in Florida that have the highest or lowest SNAP usage. So, um, you know, yeah, um, from from CARES Engagement Network, they do have a lot of tools um, so you can query data. Um, so say if we want to look for census tracts, um, actually, let's do the um, Households with no vehicle. Okay, so back to tools. We want to find census tracts where the percent of housing is, or percent of vehicles with um, zero households is greater than, um, let's do 15 and then run the query and it'll highlight those. So I just picked, I, oh, that does not look right though. Occupied housing, percent of occupied housing units. Sorry, that's why, less, greater than 15. Do I have my greater than less than signs mixed up right now? <laughs> there we go. Greater than 15%. So this is how you can use the tools to query. Um, if you want to find census tracts where greater than 15% of the occupied housing units have no car, this is what how you could do it. And then you can um, show attributes. So you can download a table and it'll list all the census tracts It'll list the population, the number of houses specifically, and the percents. 
um, and you can download that into an Excel sheet. So you could you could come in and query for whatever you're looking for specifically, and then pull that out, um, and then that becomes a lot of work. <laughs> right. Right. I think I hope that answered what what that question was asking. I think that's very helpful. Um, and then the last question is is how often do we update the data? Um, so we launched this report card tool back in September of 2019, and the data itself, it, as, as we've mentioned, comes from the CARES Engagement Network. And so I know they regularly add new data sets and update um, the data that's available here, um, but the actual report card, it's um, only updated uh, as, as soon as we um, you know, have a new opportunities to to work with the team that develops this on, on the programming side and so there, there's definitely a lot of work that goes into that but um but we try you know if if there's new data out there we try to include it in the next iteration of, of a tool like this that, that we develop and if people are using the cares engagement network directly um that is literally updated uh, just every day there's new and there's um I'm, I'm not looking at the screen so i'm not exactly sure where it is but there is a feature like if you're looking at there's a option to see like new um, or recently added data and so um if i if, if i'm using it every few days every time i log on there's there's something new there so um so the data source is constantly being updated and if you're looking for particular indicators or you want to say oh i want to make sure i have the most current um the most current version of this particular data set, you can always get it directly from there. That's true, thank you. Um, well, that is, those are all the questions we had. I thank everyone for their time today. Um, I know Amanda did a really nice overview and um, showed us some maps. If anybody wanted any last kind of, um, you know, let's look at my county or let's look at this particular indicator, feel free to to share that in, in the chat box or in the questions. Um, and if not, we will um, conclude today's webinar. I haven't seen any suggestions yet. So it says, um, yeah, nope. All right, well, thank you everyone so much for your time today. We hope you enjoyed this presentation. Please be sure to visit our website. Please um, check out the report card tool and also visit the other resources we have. Um, as, again, the stories on our website, the information and updates on different policy examples are updated daily by our content curation team. Um, and our team is also here to help. If you have any specific questions, feel free to email us and um, we'd be more than happy to work with you to, to help answer those questions as best as we can. Um, thank you again. We hope that you'll continue to prioritize um, health equity in your own community and that you'll take this data to your leaders and um, your community as well and show them that this is something that they can use, that this is a powerful tool that can be used to promote equity um, for all families, um, especially right now as we all live through these times and um, these challenging times of COVID-19 pandemic. So thanks again. Thank you, Dr. Matha. It was so wonderful um, to hear your experience, to see firsthand how you've used this and how, um, how this can benefit others. And thank you, Amanda, for um, really diving into the data for us. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. Yeah, email us if you have any questions. Thank you. Bye-bye.